Thank you. Well, thank you for inviting me. It's, uh, it's very good to be here. Um, and, I, and I do just want to say a quick word about the LSE's International Inequalities Institute, which um, Mary mentioned. Um, it is a fantastically important um, initiative, I think. And um, please do look at our website. Um, think about coming to our conferences. We have this very large funding from Atlantic Philanthropies, as TASC also does, um, the largest ever gift to the LSE. And we have a 20-year program training fellows to try and combat inequality across the world. It would be fantastic to have Irish fellows amongst their numbers. So please do, please do um, get in touch to talk about that. OK, so what, what I want to try and do um, in my 40 minutes is um, reflect upon some trends in global inequalities. Um, I'm speaking, I'm not an economist, um, I'm a sociologist, um, and I'm therefore interested not just in the economic dimensions of inequality, but also how they straddle <coughs> questions of culture, politics, and society. And my big concern is that the economic inequalities which we see in the world are increasingly shaping a whole variety of outcomes, not just life chances, but also politics um, and social divisions more generally. And living as I do in the UK, you, you, it's so apparent that one of the major manifestations we've had about this issue is in the rise of populism. Um, and it's very kind of ironic if you compare these two quotes um, from Nigel Farage, the leader of UKIP, um, who la about a year ago was uh, saying how wonderful the uh, UK electorate had voted for Brexit. Um, and what's very clear here is the way in which he saw that as a triumph against the establishment. We made June 23rd our Independence Day when we smashed the establishment. Very clear notion of an elite. Um, he's not calling the elite a wealthy elite, but there's no <laughs> doubt in my mind, and I'm going to try and go on to show this, that that picks up on the fact that many people in the UK feel they've been left out, they feel they've been marginalised, and they want to, to protest against this establishment. And how interesting it is, I mean, we had a wonderful, comparatively wonderful uh, result last week in the, the election. Um, with uh, the Labour Party doing much better than anyone was anticipating six weeks ago. Um, and Jeremy Corbyn very much picked up on, in his first major speech in the election, very much picked up on the same kind of theme. Um, we don't accept that it's natural for Britain to be governed by a ruling elite. Now, this is a very, very uh, naked, direct form of um, awareness about inequality, it seems to me. And you don't really see a great history of this very direct thinking in previous decades in, in the UK. But of course, it's not just the UK. Um, this is Donald Trump's inauguration just a few months ago. Um, hugely ironic, you know, there he was, um, surrounded by his billionaire friends. Um, and yet, he makes this very, very direct appeal to the American people. Um, the establishment protected itself, but not the citizens of our country. Washington flourished but the people did not share in its wealth. It's a very, you know, it's deeply ironic that he's saying that, given his own economic situation. But again, it testifies to the power of this populist appeal, which I think can only be understood in the context of global economic inequality trends. And my final example um, is a more interesting one in some ways, a more paradoxical, which is the election of Emmanuel Macron in France um, a few weeks ago. In some respects, he seems to go against the populist tide. And obviously, there was great fear in France that, um, uh, that the, the, the National Front would do much better than they did do in the end. Uh, and Macron appeared to sort of be this candidate from the centre. But what's interesting is that even in the French context, um, various voices position him as a kind of candidate of the establishment, of the elite. So this is just a, something I took from the web about France's newly established newly elected leader, represents the European establishment, fearful of a popular revolt. Former MI5 intelligence officer Andy and Mac and Mac Macron tells RT. Former US President Barack Obama endorsed Macron. The EU endorsed Macron. So we're living, you know, even in this case, which appears to be a kind of centrist, moderate success story, um, may even have halted the tide of populism in some respects. Even here, it is being read as a statement about the, the, the division between the establishment and uh, the masses, the people. 
So we live, I think, in very, very um, sensitive times, very telling times politically. And what I want to try and do is contextualise uh, this moment in terms of global economic inequality trends. And um, I want to make, I've actually got, um, you know, I'm going to give a very simple one level praise here of some of the trends. This may be familiar to some of you, given your uh, expertise in, in task and so forth, but I've actually got an argument which I'll present in four steps. Um, and the argument is very strongly, in a way, influenced by uh, Thomas Piketty, the French economist, who I know you've had over here sort of talking to you. Um, he's been working in the LSE. Um, and he's making, he makes this really important point, which I've got to try and establish and uh, elaborate, that we need to broaden our focus away from um, income inequality, important though that is, to look at the issue of wealth inequality and accumulation. And once we do that, we can see the longer term trends and we can have a much more depressing, I think, account of the extent and the seriousness of inequality than if we just focus on income inequality. Although the income inequality story is also pretty, pretty bleak. And along the way, I'll try and spice up the story with some insights from sociological research and make the point that you know, the economic world is not just separated from the rest of society. It spills over in all sorts of ways and it's increasingly having a very profound and damaging effect on the social fabric. Um, I'm not going to use any figures, but I will use a variety of graphs. Um, uh, the, world in, the, the Wealth Inequality Database, um, which Piketty and his colleagues established, is very, 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 very useful for developing some um, simple indices of income inequality. Um, and the first point I want to make is this. Uh, income inequality has increased substantially in the world, um, in, many, in most nations in the world, over the last 30 years. There's no doubt about that. Um, if you look at the figures for the OECD in blue here, um, and this is a, these are Gini coefficients, so the higher they are, the more inequality there is. You can see, particularly from the mid-80s to the early 2000s, a general trend towards the increase in inequality. However, since uh, the 2000s, it's sort of flattened a bit, but slightly gone up. And in several nations, uh, you've seen a downturn recently. Norway, uh, uh, Spain, uh, UK, and so forth. The pattern of income inequality is now a bit more mixed than it was five or six years ago. So five or six years ago when Joe Stiglitz was writing his famous articles about the 1%, there was a very strong um, recognition that income inequality trends were getting worse in many nations. But the, the, the record, and I want to try and establish this point a bit more, the record is now a bit more uh, mixed about that. But uh, and there are some really uh, important outliers. And the most important outlier of all is the United States of America. Um, and we need to emphasize the US because the US, uh, much of our thinking about in income inequality comes from the US. And it's a very, very bleak story. So um, if I can get my pointer back in. This is the top 1%. Their share of the national income in the US rose from just over 10% to about uh, 20%. And it's pretty much gone up. A few, few wobbles here and there, but it's pretty much gone up uh, substantially, and it continues to go up, even leaving aside the 2008 recession, financial crash. Whereas, as you can see, um, <coughs> the situation for the bottom 50% has gone in the opposite direction. So they now uh, have a little more than 10% of the national income. If you want to understand the election of Donald Trump, it seems to me that graph does a pretty good story explaining why a lot of Americans in the, in the Rust Belt felt pretty fed up with the direction of American society. And you can see why economists like Stiglitz saw the rise of the 1% as a fundamental shift in American society, which has, has gone on a different government, Clinton, uh, Bush, um, even Obama, to some extent, there were Obama less than some of the other presidents. But the US is not the world, um, and we do need to recognize that it's very different in other societies. France is probably uh, the country which is the opposite. If, amongst the developed nations, France is the polar opposite of the US. So actually in, the US, in France, there's been virtually no trend towards increasing inequality over the last 40 years. This is a share of 1%, still under 10% of the national income. 
that's the share that bottom 50%, around 30% of the national income. Taxation levels in, uh, in France on the wealthy remain high, very strong commitment to public services. Um, and it goes to show that uh, a national government concerned about inequality can make a difference. There's not a, there's not a need to have the top 1% uh, getting a greater share of the pie. Really important, and I'm going to come back to this point, really important that Piketty is coming from the French context. You know, his, his reputation is global, but he's very mindful of the French experience in saying there's no unilinear trend for advanced capitalism to have greater inequality and the 1% pulling ahead. So I think those are the two extreme nations amongst the developed world. Um, if one looks at other European nations, and I've got Ireland in here, and obviously the, the report um, which you've got in your pack has much more detailed and much more up-to-date information than comes from the World Incomes Database. The other, uh, but the other European nations in this uh, picture here are sort of intermediate between those two extremes. And this is just a share of the top 1% in this case. Um, and I think the point I would, I would make is actually since about 2008, most European nations have seen the top 1% turning down. Um, that is true, even in, I mean, the UK um, in blue is the kind of, it's the European nation, apart from Ireland perhaps, which follows the American model most closely. And you can see the rise of 1%, but since 2008, the share of 1% has gone down. Taxation was slightly raised on, the, on those um, only 100, over £150,000 in the aftermath of the financial crash. And the same is true in um, Spain and Sweden uh, and Germany. So actually, it's, uh, and I've heard economists argue that actually the big trend towards the top 1% pulling away has now in many nations halted. USA perhaps is an exception, I mean there are some exceptions. Perhaps the really extreme years of income inequality increasingly being focused on the top 1% has sort of moderated. That's the first point then. Actually, national governments can affect income inequality, and the recent trends are not, unilinear, not unilaterally bad. They are bad in some contexts, but not in all contexts. But the second uh, feature I want to bring out is um, looking at the issue globally. And I don't know how many of you are familiar with this graph. It's, this has become a very, very famous graph in the last year or so since it was produced by the uh, development economist Branko Milanovic. Um, it's famously been called the, the elephant graph. This is, this is the elephant's body, this is the trunk. Um, and what, what Milanovic did is he pooled uh, survey data on most nations in the world. So most of the studies by economists are focusing upon different national comparisons. You know, you're comparing the UK and the US, Ireland, France, Germany, wherever. And you're looking at trends in those countries. But well, obviously in a global world, it's important to think about um, the global context, it's also important to recognise that countries vary hugely in terms of the population size. Um, so what Milanovic did here is he actually pooled data on the entire world. He did very complex calculations to kind of equalise um, currency exchange rates um, and income and uh, cost of living to work out what the trends had been globally in terms of flows to different income groups. Uh, he's, it's a bit out of date now, it's between 1988 and 2008. Um, so basically the higher this figure here, that's the higher the uh, particular income groups in the world distribution have seen their income rise in this 20-year in this period. So over here, this is the global 1%. Over here, so the, this is the most poor people in the world in 1988. And uh, the interesting point here, um, so here is the kind of what we'd expect. This is the 1% this is the grouping who we know did really, really well. Um, and this, as this graph points out, this is the, the very rich top 1% in the world is actually 12% of the American population, because it's a very wealthy country in 1988. But it also includes substantial numbers of British, Japanese, French, German, European people. And as we, as we can see, their share of the national income and their, uh, has, uh, the global income has risen by about 50%. This is the elephant's trunk. But actually, um, We've also seen this remarkable increase in incomes in the sort of 15th to the 65th distribution of the global population. 
This is the emerging middle classes in China, India, parts of Africa, parts of South America. Um, and actually, in fact, they actually did better than the global 1%. Of course, they began from a much lower base. Right? So that, that, that actually, they're pulled away. this group has pulled away. But in relative terms, these are the really uh, significant success stories. And um, the people who've lost out are the people at the very bottom, mainly in sub-Saharan Africa. So they've still been left behind. But also, interestingly, is this group here. This is a group which is very prosperous in global terms <coughs> in 1988. These were, um, these were the working classes, if you like, of Europe and North America, who were not rich in, their, in, the, in the terms of their own country, but they were rich globally. Um, these are the people who have lost their jobs as a result of uh, globalization of production. Um, and I think, it's, again, if you want to understand populism in many parts of the world, this graph helps explain it, because I very much remember Donald Trump making this speech in his campaign saying, well, the jobs have gone to China, um, which is over here. Um, and similarly, those Americans are aware that they're super wealthy, done really well. So if you are in the, mid, in the, in the Midwest, or if you're a kind of former car worker or coal miner around here, you absolutely see you lost, you lost to this lot and to this lot. So it's quite a, a telling, I think, graphic explaining kind of the global trends towards inequality and how they are having distinctive effects in shaping people's perceptions. Um, but, so we, uh, we, so we have actually globally, and this is kind of one of the paradoxical effects going on, um, development economists have actually argued inequality is declining in the world. It's increasing in some rich nations, but globally it's declining because some of the previously poorer countries are catching up with some of the previously richer countries. However, what we're also seeing is increasingly some of the poorer nations, some of the developing nations, um, seeing big increases in income inequality in their ranks. And what's telling about this is, this is a again, from the World Incomes Database, um, Wealth and Income Database, the, the red areas have the highest levels of inequality. Um, includes the uh, UK, but also includes North America, but also parts of South America, parts of Africa. Um, and actually, therefore, what appears to be happening now is we had a period where um, inequality globally was declining as China and uh, India and so forth were getting more prosperous, but increasingly as those... As inequality increases in those nations, we probably will see global inequality increase again. Um, here we see the trends towards the top 1% uh, and their share of the national income in places like South Africa, um, in India, uh, in China. In China is in red. It's actually flattened a bit. Um, Japan has gone up a bit. Um, but uh, South Africa is now one of the most unequal countries in the world. And it's a very interesting kind of paradoxical story. Here's a post-apartheid country, uh, and actually that period has coincided with actually the growth of economic inequality. So many of the white South Africans are even better off now than they were before. It's kind of, these are kind of ironies of, of economic change across the globe. Okay, so what I hope to emphasize is therefore that actually um, income inequality evidence is quite complex. And there's, the trends are mixed, and there are some glimmers of hope. Um, if you go to many South, African, South American nations, the Gini coefficients declined in the last 15 years, partly because many nations in South America are developing cash transfer policies towards poor populations. Um, so governments can actually tackle income inequalities, and there are some success stories. However, once we turn to the issue of wealth, the picture gets much bleaker and much more depressing. Um, and this is where Thomas Piketty's work is so important, because what his real contribution intellectually is to say income inequality is a serious issue, but actually it's the accumulation of capital in his terms, or wealth in our terms, which is the fundamental thing we should be worried about. Um, and I think he's absolutely right. And of course, uh, you may well be familiar with this famous report by Oxfam, which uh, they produced a few months ago. Uh, which is looking at the distribution of global wealth. And they reckon that eight, the eighth most wealthy billionaires in the planet own the same wealth as the poorest 50% 50, 50 of the population 
very, very startling figure, um, and indicates the extent to which wealth inequalities are more entrenched and more serious and more accumulating than income inequalities. Um, here, I'll give you a few examples of this. Um, this is the US, which we've already seen is the most sort of unequal country, and the trends are pretty bleak there for income inequality. Here's the income inequality trends, which we saw before. The top 1% getting a steadily larger share of the pie. Um, but if you took wealth, the money tied up in your housing, stocks and shares, savings, uh, the picture's even worse. Um, so, I mean, we all know that wealth is more concentrated than uh, income because you can store wealth, you can accumulate wealth. You know, it can be, have a long-term effect. Uh, so in 1980, which is relatively equal, um, you still find the top 1% of wealth owners having a greater share of the wealth pie than the income pie. But actually, over time, that gap has got bigger. Um, so now, in, 19, in 2014, the gap between those two figures is bigger than it was between those two figures 25 years ago. So wealth is even more depressing than income in the US. But what's really important, and this is, this is where Piketty's work is really fundamental, so France is relatively egalitarian. Okay? As I was saying before, in income inequality terms, France has not seen a trend towards the top 1% pulling away in income terms, but in wealth terms, it has. Um, and this, this bubble here, I think, must be produced by um, the uh, dot-com boom by the kind of valuation of stock markets. But leaving, leaving that aside, you can see that the top 1% of wealth in France increased from a low point of 15% to just under 25% in a relatively egalitarian country. And this is Piketty's fundamental point, that wealth accumulates, tends to accumulate faster than the growth in national economies, and therefore those who've got wealth, without making any extra effort, if, if you like, they just tend to accumulate it. Uh, my famous, my, my favourite anecdote from his, from his long book is that um, Bill Gates has earned more since he stopped being CEO of Microsoft than when he than he, when he was CEO, simply because his savings could accumulate such vast returns. Um, and Piketty's point also, and that of his, of his colleagues, are that actually the same generally in Europe, um, top 1% wealth share in Europe has gone up in the last 15 years. So even if the income inequality trends are ambivalent, the wealth inequality trends appear to be getting steadily worse. Uh, yeah, that's certainly true in the US, as we've seen, but it's true in, in Europe too. So insofar as we've got seriously entrenched inequalities, it's, it's the issue of wealth accumulation in all its manifestations, which has to be the centre of our attention. And that's even more... Uh, um, I'm sure I'm, I'm on the third point now. Um, that's even more true when we recognise that many of the calculations which, which economists make of uh, inequality they relativise uh, the, the growth of national economy. So they're looking at the 1% share of the national income, recognising that the national income changes over time and may be going up. But if you bear in mind that many economies, actually most economies, have grown in absolute terms in the last 30 years, the absolute gap between the top 1% and the bottom has grown massively, even if, as in France, so, the share say the same. You get the logic of that. So, uh, um, you know, one way of thinking about this is if you are a poor guy or a poor woman trying to start out uh, and trying to catch up with the very rich, it's just a lot further to get these days because the rich are pulled away and they own a lot more capital than was the case 30 years ago. So, and I think that that is really, you know, that's a really significant feature. So, all nations, including Ireland, which I think I'm Ireland here, but um, just the, the, the average market value per adult has grown substantially. And that, even without any trends towards the top 1% pulling away, just means the gap between the rich and poor has grown in absolute terms massively. Here's the Irish figures. Um, much more detail in the report. Okay, final point then. Um, 
Therefore, if we see wealth as being a crucial issue, then inheritance is fundamental to understanding the dynamics of inequality. And also, of course, this is where the link comes with housing, which I'm not an expert on housing, but it absolutely ties in with the debates and your discussions later on today. Um, housing issues and the accumulation of health, of, of, ha of wealth tied up in housing becomes central to inequality more generally. Um, I'll just say a few, few, few words about this, a few comments about this. Um, so inheritance can mean diff many different things. Um, but one of the things it can mean is, you know, to what extent are your chances in life affected by the chances, sorry, by, by your parents' situation in life? And obviously one of the defences put forward for inequality is to say, well, as long as it's possible for people to climb the ladder, then it's okay to have inequalities because, you know, if a, if a really talented kid works hard uh, and gets to the top, and that's a sign that actually perhaps inequality is a motivation force. You know, this is kind of <coughs> typical defence of uh, inequality. And that argument has been put forward by many governments, including in the US and the UK, about, well, you know, income inequality is not a bad thing because actually they motivate people to work hard. But what is increasingly apparent is actually, if you look at social mobility comparatively, those countries which have more inequality have less social mobility. That is to say that... Um, the, the prospects of kids is increasingly dependent upon the, the situation of the parents. Uh, and this, again, this graphic became famous a few years ago, produced by um, uh, American economist Miles Korak, which compared uh, mobility in different countries. So intergenerational earnings elasticity. So over here, the earnings of kids are very closely linked into the earnings of your parents. And if this, a, if this is a low mark, it means you, there's not much elasticity, the, the, the incomes could be different. So the equal nations, Finland, Norway, Denmark, down here, uh, the unequal nations, UK, US, Italy are up here. Um, so, in, and you know, of course we all recognise this, we all see it about how uh, rich parents find all sorts of strategies, whether it comes from internship to paying for private tutors for your kids, <laughs> paying high fees to go to the best universities or whatever, but there are strategies which can be used to lever your kids into the best positions. And this trend appears to be getting worse. And of course, it's a, it's a kind of self-reinforcing prophecy. So the, work, the, the, work, the, long, the longer it continues, the more it generates inequality in its own terms. Um, so that's one aspect, but I want to just say a few words about the housing aspect, okay, which I hope may be some link to your discussions a bit later on today. And this comes very much from Piketty's work. Um, so what he's done in his book, and, uh, and if you read his book carefully, you'll see that um, one of the problems about taking his arguments forward is actually there's not much great data on wealth, sorry, on capital or wealth um, in most nations. We have pretty good data on income inequality in many nations. We have less good data on wealth inequality. France is his main... Um, case study because that's we have extremely good data on France um, and uh, the point I simply make is that and this is a very famous graph he has about the the, uh, the amount of capital the amount of wealth compared to the national income uh, over time and he makes this point you know, in pre-industrial societies there's a very high proportion of wealth compared to the national income this is stored accumulated wealth land ownings and as you can see, it's a big black area. So in pre-industrial societies, most wealth is tied up in agricultural land. That's what you expect. Society is industrialised, that goes down, and you find the growth of um, other kinds of domestic capital. But what you've seen in France in the past um, recent decades is this grey area, which is housing capital, increasing a lot. So much of the wealth, which is increasing as a share of national income, is tied up in owner-occupied housing. Um, it's become now the dominant share of wealth in France. It wasn't, you know, uh, 50 years ago. That's true in the UK too, um, where you find this big grey pattern of the growth of housing capital. Um, one of the implications of that is inheritance becomes more and more important um, with owner-occupiers, wealthy owner-occupiers passing on uh, the value of their housing to their kids. Um, 
And it's a really significant feature because, you know, when you've got a situation where um, inheritance drives housing markets and drives um, own occupation, then it's deeply, deeply unfair. It locks out people who haven't got access to that kind of wealth and accumulation. And Piketty's point is actually in France in the mid 70s, the share, the, the share of inherited wealth in total wealth was under 50%. So in that, in that period, most of the wealth was kind of earned. People actually had to go out and get it uh, using various things. But in, increasingly, um, we now have 80% of the, he reckons, of the wealth in France is inherited. It's not, uh, it's not caused by people using their skills or talents. It's just been handed down. Um, Again, this big stuff comes from Piketty about the... He, he reckons that if you look at this graph increasing, so this is French people again in the early 20th century, early 21st century, 14% of them can now expect to inherit um, half, half of the average um, income, lifetime income, which I reckon is about um, uh, three or 400,000 euros. It's not just the 1%. The 1% obviously do really, really well, but it's actually 14%. So this is a really significant force. So two minutes left. Um, just trying to summarise. Uh, so I think any, you know, inequality is a massive issue. It is, it, it is a fundamental issue. It's, it's, um, but we're also seeing income inequality as one dimension, but wealth inequality becoming more and more serious. And as this proportion of capital to income increases, as it has done for Piketty uh, in many nations, we can expect issues of inheritance, of accumulation, of housing, housing inequalities, to increasingly drive um, inequality issues more generally. As that happens, uh, one, of the, one of the necessary implications is age is going to be an increasingly significant divide. And we see this in all sorts of ways about the way in which young people are getting locked out of housing markets and wealth. Um, and this is just a kind of Interesting graphic produced from last week's election results. Um, we're too early to get the detailed analysis, but it seems like the success of the Labour Party was very much driven by younger people coming out to vote. Um, younger people of all kinds, actually, whatever class, feel they're being locked out of the wealth which their parents and their grandparents have. Um, and that the growth of age inequality is one of the big in increases of inequality of any. So in the UK and in many European nations, um, you know, it's actually that the trend for young people to be much worse off than their equivalent 30, 40 years ago, which, which is very dramatic. <coughs> and so, um, therefore, as we move towards inequalities based upon accumulation and wealth, <laughs> so uh, I think there's about to be more mobilisation against elites, because elites, above all, benefit from that wealth accumulation process. Um, you know, this is just a very simple figure from the Sunday Times Rich List about the number of billionaires in the UK. 100 in 2005. We had a bit of a dip in 2008, but immediately they, they climbed back up, and the number of billionaires has gone up by three times in just 10 years. Um, so clearly at the top, there's huge uh, movement towards increasing wealth and increasing wealth concentration, and that is bound, I think, to generate and to fuel forms of populist movement. If you want to read more about this kind of argument, um, very much based upon British data, but we try and make the argument and make it more accessibly, then please do have a look at my book, which came out uh, uh, 18 months ago. Thank you very much. Thank you, and I didn't even get to use my last one minute. <laughs> We've got plenty of time now, and thanks very much to Mike for setting that up well. And one can't help wondering what those, the, I mean, the focus on in, inheritance and housing, uh, we're very aware of that meta-narrative in Irish politics. Um, but also that, that focus on wealth being produced and the, the growth in those billionaires in the last one and, and their increased power and ownership of media and how, how that relates to politics and populism as well has been a, a, a very significant story of the US and, and, and UK. So I want to throw that out to the floor in terms of we're going to, we've got about 15 minutes. Um, so if you could stand up when you want to make a question, just so that we can pick you up in the, the, the videoing of the conference and um, to say who you are, where you're from, um, and to keep it short so we can get in as many people as possible. There is a book in England called Imputed, Imputed, Imputed in the 
in the 21st century. Right. Now we have to look at the economics of the European Union and how it decimates people in working con con conditions. People forced into pre pre a precarious and zero hour working areas. We have to listen to the to the actual person last night who confronted Mr. Actually Snow on Channel Four, who talked about a terror a terror of the austerity of of eco of economics. Okay. And we have to look at the campaign that highlights capitalism and the political rights that brought the Corbyn vote forward. What type of Europe are we looking at? We have to equally say that the liberal economic agenda that has gone down in this country, and when you look at the assholes of Fine Gael in 2017, okay. is quite bloody frightening. Okay, thanks, Khan. And the, the last question of this is to the guy behind. Thank you. How are you doing? My name is Michael McCarthy Flynn. I'm with Oxfam Ireland. I'd like to thank Mike um, for, for giving us a, a, a mention there um, and also for concentrating on wealth inequality and global inequality. Um, Oxfam is working on this issue, obviously, on a, on a global level. And we're also working in a number of countries around the world, from Indonesia to Nigeria to Malawi, bringing out similar reports to what TASC has done today on documenting inequality levels in the country and trying to get a public dialogue about it. And what we've found in many countries where we wouldn't expect inequality to take off, many authoritarian countries, there is a lot of public engagement on it. Um, and I'd like your thoughts on how that compares to more well-established Western countries, including Ireland, um, where inequality seems, in a lot of countries, to be taken over by populist movements, especially right-wing movements. How does an organisation like TAS talk about inequality that it's seen as something that is politically achievable within Ireland, because it's often a dirty word? Thanks. OK, thank you. So three very different, but very relevant questions. Thank you. Um, yeah, on the dementia tax, it's, it's, it's extremely interesting. I mean, um, and we saw the, th the same issue in the previous election, um, 2015, that, uh, that when the Labour Party had some um, you know, fairly moderate policies about a mansion tax, inheritance tax is not popular in the UK. Um, and concerns about using, you know, using accumulated wealth um, to use for elderly care, it, it's not, it, 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 is, it does affect people. So there is, a, I think there's a mismatch between kind of um, how this policy is seen to be uh, uh, undermining people's kind of rights when actually, in fact, it predominantly benefits people who are in, in the top few percentile of the, of the population. Part of the issue is the fact which Piketty emphasizes and which I try to indicate in my graphs, that people who would benefit from, um, you know, uh, the accumulation of housing wealth and so forth. It's not just the 1%, it does go further and down than that. It's what Piketty calls a patrimonial middle classes. And so many people who are not, never going to be in the top 1% or even the top 5% still feel they might, they might lose out from that. And I think the task there is to think, and that's particularly true given, you know, if you're living in London, say, or Dublin, you know, you, you particularly feel that because, you know, you're, you, you find it's a, in London it's a common situation where People can, be, people can be living in a house worth a million pounds, which obviously in global terms, you're just massively well off. You're global millionaires or whatever, but you don't feel well off because in your, you're in a housing market where houses of that value are not particularly unusual. So it's, I think it's a matter of trying to find a way to, to, to wed people away from a feeling that actually, um, you know, you should feel threatened by that. And I think part of it is therefore thinking about how you develop a kind of public public services, you know, and, and emphasising there's a public structure, public infrastructure of welfare, which will I mean, ensure that people are, will be supported in other ways when they become elderly. But it's a hard battle. I mean, it's an absolutely hard battle. Uh, you know, because we've seen you know, attacks on the welfare state and the welfare system, people feel, feel vulnerable. And therefore, if you've got some assets of your own, they're the last ones you want to see possibly clawed back by the state. So you can understand why people have that defensive reaction, but it's not helping the situation. Um, on the EU and uh, the politics of neoliberal capitalism, uh, it's not an area where I'm uh, an expert. And uh, 
I'm completely aware that uh, the EU is practicing a very um, distinctive form of kind of uh, corporatist capitalism. Um, I have to say, speaking as a, as, as a British person, where Theresa May holds out the alternative of kind of being a tax haven on the Singapore model, I can't help feeling the European model is a bit more... Uh, I, I'm inclined towards the European, <laughs> the European model a bit more. Um, I, I guess it's kind of which devil, which is the worst devil we have to... We have to stop with, um, but these, you know, the, I think these issues will pan out and then appear in different sorts of countries. On the Oxfam issue, I absolutely agree with you, and we've been working closely with colleagues from Oxfam in the LSE. Um, we're currently working with them on a global inequality framework to think about um, developing a diagnostic for inequality across the world. Uh, it's very exciting work, um, and I've, I think very much that um, the issue of kind of how inequality can be part of progressive political movements um, and can drive a kind of more effective form of, you know, redist redistributionist populism um, versus where it becomes tied into kind of nationalist and xenophobic politics. It's very much a matter for local, local contestation and local battles, you know. So in many South American countries, I mean, that, that feeling about inequality being an issue has generated um, redistributionist governments to some extent. Um, whereas in the US, it has obviously fueled uh, Donald Trump's rise to power. So I absolutely think that it, it is something which um, the trends are there, but we can try and mobilise them and get people to think differently. And it's the work of activists and campaigners to try and do that. And, you know, um, I think there are some very positive things we can, we can gain some hope from. Okay, thank you. So, we've got one here, one, and one more. Yeah. Okay. So... Yourself there in the middle? Yeah, if you just wait for the mic. Just to, thank you. Um, my name is Claudine Gaidoni, and I am a member of a group called Attack, a citizens group. Um, I believe that Thomas Piketty and his colleague Gabriel Zuckman emphasised the role of tax havens in the accumulation of wealth. Mm -hmm. And I think this might be something that should be emphasised the role of tax havens and the way to combat the role of tax havens, in particular the demand for the public register of ultimate beneficial owners of companies and trusts, which plays a great part in passing on wealth and increasing wealth. Thank you. Okay, yeah. Thank you. And we're over to this side. There's no, a mic on the way, Chisa. And then... Yeah. And then thank you. Uh, my name is John Higgins. I'm a civil society activist. And I'd like uh, to ask uh, Dr. Savage if he feels that the proliferation of uh, trade deals with ISDS clauses will exacerbate the shift towards wealth, uh, towards the 1% of the elite. Okay, what, 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 can, you, can you explain those clauses? ISDS? Uh, investor state dispute settlement, which are uh, available only to corporations. Um, and are included in all the new generation trade deals, okay. yeah. including CETA, uh, TTIP, and uh, Singapore trade deal, um, the, which uh, the CETA, which is due for ratification around the 1st of July, which hasn't really been debated here in Ireland yet. Thank you. Okay, okay thank you. And um, yourself, just straight in front, yeah. Hi, uh, uh, my, my name is Cathy Reynolds. I'm a student in Trinity of uh, social policy. Um, this might be a naive question considering the uh, expertise in the room. Um, I'd be interested if you could um, describe some of the things France has done differently uh, to avoid this, the, this uh, income inequality. Obviously, the wealth inequality is different. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, well, thank you for that. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> um, and uh, certainly, the f certainly the first two are very much about the global issues, um, which, are very, which are very significant. Um, yeah, on the tax havens issue, abs abs absolutely correct, correct. And actually, this goes back to the point which was asked in the front earlier on about um, why some people don't like um, you know, the idea of losing their, their inheritance. Um, because there is a feeling that actually, um, you know, if you're really, really well off, you manage to screw us all away, and you never get subject to inheritance tax and all these things. And it's only kind of moderately well off or even sort of moderately poor people who have to pay it. And I said, no doubt about that, that is, and uh, Zuckman and his colleagues are absolutely correct about that. 
Um, and you know, we see these amazing cases in uh, in uh, London where the majority of of uh, prime properties are being bought by by offshore companies. You know, they're not being bought by individuals who can be named and labelled as such. So I think that's absolutely a crucial dynamic. And Piketty, in his book, of course, makes this point about uh, we need global financial transparency in order to be able to try and track these issues. Um, I absolutely think that's right. I mean, how we bring it about practically, I have no idea. I mean, it's, it seems to me it's, it would need a huge shift in not just, you know, national governance, but actually you need to have every nation or the vast majority of nations sign up to this being an issue. And how you actually, actually achieve that, given what's happening in global politics with... Uh, the US, you know, withdrawing from the Paris Agreement and Britain withdrawing from the EU, I, I, I don't know. But um, without that, you're quite right. I think it's going to be very difficult. It's going to be very difficult to tackle things on a national level. Um, on the issue of the yeah, the, the, the trade deals, I'm not an expert. I have to say, I'm not an expert on these things. I do know some of the controversy about TTIP, um, which has obviously been a, a, a very significant factor in the way in which top corporations use these treaties to get advantages. Um, so, you know, you, you're probably more of an expert than me, but I absolutely think that's going to be crucial. It's, about, it's a matter of thinking about the, the uh, ways in which we develop global um, links and global ties in, in forms which are not going to be um, inegalitarian. A lot of uh, apparently technical issues get wrapped up as technical, but in fact they have uh, very significant social implications and they don't always come out because they, they seem to be dealt with by experts and, and people. Um, the French situation, um, I'm not, again, <laughs> I keep I'm not an expert, I'm not an expert on France, uh, but it's certainly the case that um, they didn't go through the same wave of privatisations, which many other countries did. Um, they still have uh, a very strong public sector, and they certainly have much higher levels of taxation. You know, in fact, I recently saw a survey about how much, you know, how much a particular higher salary would, would translate into take-home pay. You know, and in France, it's simply much lower because um, you, you, they, the um, French high earners pay a much higher portion of their income in, in uh, taxation, and in return, they get very generous pensions and, they, and very generous um, health service. So, uh, you know, and, and it's interesting that has persisted even with different governments, you know, but socialist and also um, more right-wing ones. Uh, I think it's kind of, it is seen to be a kind of commitment to kind of republican principles. So again, it is a matter of, you know, thinking about different models of, of running our countries. Thank you. So we're doing well. So we, we can take maybe one or two more. Okay, we've got Paul and we've got one over here. So just in the middle here. Just hang on for the mic cause to, to get picked up in the audio. Thank you. Mike, can I challenge you on something you said? And maybe it was a throwaway yeah, remark. Yeah, you sure. Said, um, a lot of the jobs, or the jobs went offshore. But, and you mentioned mining, but mining Trump's little baby, the jobs went because natural gas came along. And one of the advantages, why well, there's no jobs or less jobs, yeah. is there's less deaths. But just take the car industry, producing much more cars with much less people. So it's really automation yeah. rather than offshoring. Just your thoughts on that. Yes, it was, an, it, it was an offhand comment. It was picking up on something Donald Trump has obviously been pitching to in the US context about you know jobs disappearing and certainly in, in the British context you know, it wasn't as a coal mining job has disappeared off to anywhere else and that's perhaps an odd example um, I mean the issue of technology um, yeah so there are these there are these predictions I mean it's what the economists call skill bias technolo technological change that's driving some of these shifts towards um, greater levels of inequality and as we get the increasing use of robots and such like that's going to enhance inequalities Certainly the predictions are that you know, robotification is going to be hitting the unskilled jobs before it hits the, the more skilled jobs, and that will exacerbate um, uh, levels, of uh, levels of inequality. Um, it has to be said, I mean, uh, these predictions have been around a long time. I mean, automation is not a new imperative within capitalist systems. Um, and it's off similar things are, are often said, and it is interesting how jobs get reinvented and reconstructed at all different levels of the, of the skill hi hierarchy. So I'm not entirely sure we should accept that as a kind of necessary trend. I think it's a matter of partly of uh, contesting, contesting certain kinds of you know, use of machinery, thinking about how we create um, jobs. We do know, um, you know, I speak as perhaps some of you in this audience, you know, if you work in the education sector, you know, we were told a few years ago that um, teaching would be completely removed by uh, 
video videoing lectures. So you, know, you never need to have a lecture again because it'll all be online. Hasn't happened. Um, you know, the human touch is actually arguably more important than it was. Um, so I think I, I, I actually believe you know we shouldn't accept a kind of um, any kind of technological logic whilst recognising that the issue of technical change is one we have to grapple with. There is, you know, I think um, a long-term debate we have to have is about the relationship between work and um, non-work and leisure, and thinking about balancing those those questions are up. And perhaps you know some people doing less work in order to make sure other people have got employment. And thinking about too about how we um, um, you know en ensure that uh, we lead balanced lives. We had a very interesting. Um, book launch at the LSC a few weeks a few weeks ago by Guy Standing arguing for basic income which is partly a, a response to this issue saying if we had a basic income model that would actually be a chance to make sure everybody had a had a kind of uh, a basic set of economic rights which would affect their position even in a highly automated society but it's clearly, clearly a debate we have to have yeah. got one more there yeah Willie Mooney from the uh, National Worker Director Group and also Communication Workers Union and basically what I wanted to do would, would you find that has been a correct uh, Correlation with the um, unequal remuneration, the ratio between uh, basic pay, basic workers' pay and uh, CEO remuneration. Yeah. Um, we find, and this is what my, my group, the National Worker Director Group in Ireland, we're trying to uh, coordinate with our colleagues across Europe. I know in Britain, they, uh, Mrs. May, she, she said at the start where it was under new term by Mrs. May, she said there's going to be worker directors on boards across in, in Britain. In Europe, it's much more of a, a, an equal uh, workers have, have direct access to boards as well as workers' councils. So I'm just just wondering, have you find, have, would that be a, a direct correlation between the exorbitant pay of CEOs as a, it's a, and yep. the average workers and the ratio between the two? Thank you. Yeah, no, it's, it's abs I absolutely think you're right. And I think we've been doing some work with the uh, the Basque country. And the Basque country is a very interesting model because um, you know they experienced a very high degree of uh, loss of industrial jobs in the 80s. And they, they, they reacted by developing a very strong cooperative movement, uh, uh, the Mondragon Corporation, which is a very successful corporation, is the best example of that. And they have this very, very strong ethos about um, the ratio between top and bottom should only be seven to one, but only, I mean, you could perhaps say that's too, a lot, but um, <laughs> compared to 40 or 50 or 60 to one, which is the case, or higher than that, which is in many American and British companies, that seems like, um, you know, m m much better. So I think, uh, yeah, absolutely. I actually think that needs to be an issue for internal debate. It's not been established that um, companies with a high, highly inegalitarian ratio are more, are more effective. Um, and it's also been one of, the, one of the arguments often made is if you don't, pay, if you, if you keep, if you trim top level pay, the people will move elsewhere. Actually, that, that's not been really been shown. I mean, in fact, mo even even wealthy CEOs tend to want to hang around where their friends and family are living. So, yeah. yeah. OK, yeah. I, we'll, we'll leave it at that one because yes. we're, we're bang on time. So yes. I'd like to, to really thank Mike for such a, a very wide range in uh, questions and answers session that actually was relatively optimistic in pointing the way to ranges of international and domestic policy agendas that actually are are realistically possible and, and that do point a way to, towards a more egal egalitarian society and that, that set us up very nicely for our next two sessions which are looking at the, the Irish welfare state um, and housing financialisation and then more generally policies and actions so we're well set up for our, for our morning's work so just to thank again Mike